but I would think that China does have a long term strategy, and I think it's it's definitely it could could very well be one of their uh, goals in the long term. Um, and and I think the roles have already switched. I think Yellen, I, I don't know if um, Janet Yellen's visit. Uh, was considered to be a success uh, by her team, but it certainly wasn't. It was really, I would say, um, certainly what wasn't what it maybe would have been five or ten years ago. And and I think that um, to me personally, it was almost sad to watch. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I've got with me again the one and only Lena Petrova, who runs her wonderful channel on finance and more and more also on geopolitics and geoeconomics. Uh, if you haven't watched her channel yet, check it out. Uh, Lena Petrova, thank you very much for coming online. Thank you for having me, Pascal. Lena, we w exchanged emails and we said we should do a segment together about uh, Janet Yellen's visit to China, because that is quite interesting. Janet Yellen is the the uh, finance secretary of the United States, right? She has, she has like the, um, well, all things money under her. And that is, that is your, your field of expertise. And you already did a video on her visit or even several videos because it was very interesting that the reason she went there or how it was reported in the media was to complain to China about its so-called overproduction. Um, I haven't heard that term before, overproduction, or I haven't heard of it as a as a as a problem that a state complains about, especially a, a, a country like the United States, which used to be all about neoliberalism, right? And exports are good, mm -hmm. and you know, whoever complained about Bangladesh overproducing cheap T-shirts that then flood the U.S. market, or uh, or cheap Vietnamese products that, that that are being sold in the United States, but now suddenly. The U.S. and 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 Miss Yellen, Mrs. Yellen, seem to be very worried about cheap Chinese products, and they call it overproduction, which is of course a framing, a framing of something that that's going on. And I wanted to have your take on um, on whether or not this means the U.S. is clearly moving away from liberal uh, this liberal discourse, which maybe maybe always is a bit of BS, but. Um, is the U.S. moving back to mercantilism and you know managed economies? Yeah, I think that's a great question because it may certainly seem that way in this particular instance, but I think, um, you know, I think this is just an excellent example of the very popular approach to many aspects related to foreign policy here. It's rules for thee, but not for me. And I think this is an excellent example. Um, so Yellen visited China and essentially the entire purpose of the visit was to accuse China of uh, so-called overcapacity and flooding the market with affordable or what you call cheap products, low cost goods. And that is precisely what the world needs because the majority of the world is actually um, living on lower incomes. So they are certainly creating the demand for goods and, and products that can be uh, purchased at a lower price point. And that is not something that the United States has um, has the capacity to really control. And of course, that's not what Yellen wants to hear, but that is that is the reality that we live in. And um, in her specific instance, she was very concerned about three sectors where China has made truly significant, truly, um, I would say, quite shocking progress. And it is solar panels, the production of solar panels, EVs, and of course, lithium batteries. And um, the reason why China managed to be so competitive is because um, it has uh, access to raw materials that it needs, and it has access to uh, vast labor resources. Those are two very, very important aspects that allow China to essentially uh, evolve in a way that fits uh, what the world demands at any given point in time. And that is precisely what they've done. They've uh, truly addressed their costs that they have to uh, put in to produce an item. And they did so by improving their wind uh, generation, uh, their green energy. 
Um, and so that allowed them to cut costs. But of course, that's not something that the Western media would tell us because that seems um, that sounds very bad, right? Because that's not something that the United States has done or has has made a substantial progress in. And so uh, Yellen focused on those three sectors. And those three sectors are the sectors where the United States wants to be a leader. They want to maintain control. They want to uh, be competitive in those three areas because that's what the world is currently going to focus on, the transition away from uh, traditional energy resources and to green energy. And that's precisely what China has already managed to do. And uh, besides that, uh, Yellen was in China to also discourage China from doing business with Russia, of course. And uh, Yellen did threaten with further sanctions as if they haven't had enough yet. Um, and uh, she also said that there will be or there might be trade barriers if uh, China doesn't really uh, change its industrial and uh, trade policies moving forward, which is, of course, something that China is very, very unlikely to do. And uh, we've seen that um, uh, when uh, Foreign Minister of Russia Lavrov arrived and he was greeted by Xi Jinping himself while Jan Yellen was still there. So I think that was, uh, to me anyway, that was uh, a message that uh, China is acting in its best interest. It's creating jobs domestically and it's able to uh, produce enough for domestic consumption as well as for exports. Um, and in terms of transitioning to mercantile thinking, I think you made a really good point. In my opinion, um, you know, um, the accusations of overcapacity, which is a very unique term. I don't think it truly exists in terms of international trade, um, but the concept of overproduction and that being used against China by Yellen, um, as well as um, effectively trying to influence China's trade policy and tell China not to do business with Russia. I think that doesn't come, those accusations and those threats, those very strong messages, as I believe Reuters put it, uh, those messages do not really come from a position of strength, in my opinion. Um, I think it's it, it shows that there's clearly um, a lack of understanding of the current sort of dynamic that is shifting truly on a daily basis. And uh, it is a sign of hypocrisy and double standards because mm -hmm. the United States would not allow any other country to uh, dictate what it can and cannot do in terms of trade and whether or not it's allowed to uh, believe in open, you know, in, in free market and, and be part of it. You put it very well. And, you know, it, this this whole episode reminds me very much of what the United States did toward Japan in the 1980s. Uh, it was it was a very similar situation. And the U.S. told Japan to stop all of these cheap exports. And actually, the Japanese then found a modus vivendi by um, by actually curbing the lower end exports to the U.S., but they increased higher end exports. Like in instead of exporting cheap cars, they exported more expensive cars, which meant then the mass market in, in the U.S. was open for U.S. car manufacturers. But the Japanese mm -hmm. company still managed to extract more money. And, you know, everybody, everybody was happy. And it seems as if, though, as if though the U.S. is trying something very similar now with China. But of course, the game is completely different and the scale is completely different. And as you put it absolutely correctly, it's a sign of weakness. Because, you know, it, the US has all the power in the world over its own territory and slap tariffs on its own on its in on its own soil on, on Chinese ex on Chinese imports. But the problem the US has is that Chinese Chinese exports, they rival US exports in Europe, in in Africa, in Asia. And that's something they dislike. And this is something they have no control over. So they go over and say like, hey, and, and try to threaten a bit and, and use this new jargon in order to convince China to kind of correct course. But I wonder why you would do that. As you said, like China made a point <laughs> of like receiving Mr. Lavrov the very next day and sending a very clear message, which is like, we're open for business to anyone. So make us the make us a good offer. Um, exactly. And this is... 
this is also like a result of the of the last 10 years of china policy because back in the days what you, what china, what us or companies would do is have controlling stakes in companies that produce cheap stuff in china but the decoupling led to all of these people letting go so there's no more us production through china right so now now mm -hmm. you've created a real rival and not somebody who like if they grow then you grow as well exactly and i i think the united states clearly recognizes that um, China, despite economic issues that I think every single country has been going through in the past three years or so, China is indeed improving and it is growing and it has an enormous potential. And that cannot be said about uh, other parts of the world. And especially, um, you know, here in the United States, uh, the cost of labor is enormous. And of course, the cost of debt with the interest rates being higher than they were before, that's driving companies out of business. So uh, the creation of new jobs here is not really, um, it's not something that you see. On the opposite, you see full-time employment decline. And that, of course, includes workers, right? Like factory workers and any, any other industries as well. But you do see full-time employment decline. And it's declining because companies are struggling. And... Um, Historically, small to mid-sized businesses have been the core of the United States economy. Um, and that's where the economy has been hit the hardest because not only is it more difficult now here in the United States to open a business, to become a business owner because the cost of that is so high, but also labor costs are, are high as well. So you cannot hire as many people as you would probably need to help you run a business. And that's not true in China. They, they do have uh, resources, they have human resources, they have um, a, improved infrastructure in terms of industrial infrastructure that allows them to uh, scale, that allows them to uh, surge produce. And that's what they've been investing in this entire time. And that's not, that's not the case here. And I think that's why, I think having recognized that, I think the United States has tried to decouple from China in a way, although it cannot afford to do it. It would hurt the United States uh, in terms of hurting its consumers the most. Um, but it did transition. It did sort of switch to Mexico. So Mexico is actually now the number one trading partner for the United States. And um, I believe this is as of 2023 last year, but it could be maybe a year earlier than that. Um, but prior to that, China used to be uh, the top trading partner. So I think that decoupling is definitely taking place in certain industries. And I think the United States probably recognizes that um, China is no longer a country that they can sort of dismiss or um, try to manipulate in a way, right? Because China is now a peer competitor and it is definitely, it's growing. So they, I think they try to move certain industries away and maybe, you know, create uh, more partnerships with Mexico next door to sort of diversify. Um, but either way, the United States will not be able to completely decouple from China without truly taking a big hit and hurting its own economy. And, and of course, we know that uh, consumers will not be able to purchase the items that they're used to purchasing. Um, and uh, the United States doesn't have the capacity to replace that production without years and years of planning and building up its own infrastructure. So that's actually one of my questions, because we have seen the US slapping a lot of sanctions on China on like in many, many sectors, especially the semiconductor sector, right, which is also backfiring hugely because China is like producing its own semiconductors in like rapid speed. And they're they're nearly on par with what the US and well, the the, the West can produce because the lithography uh, technology for that is like centered around the, the Netherlands and Japan, but they're clearly in the fold of the US. Um, there's even here in Japan, there's there's a there's a Dutch uh, uh, diplomatic representative uh, to to just liaise with the Japanese about about this trade, <laughs> about critical technologies, you know, and and this is this is being managed together. But China has been able to to produce all of that. Now, what kind of trade is not yet sanctioned by by the US? And you said like 
production is the main issue. I, in my mind, I always have like, oh, China's China's rare earths. If China stopped, if China retaliated by not sending rare earths to the US, that would maybe hurt the US quite a bit. Or on the other hand, like what kind of trade would the US not want to see like uh, a, a decoupling happening? Yeah, so I think um, the United States and China currently do trade and the trade in 2023 last time i checked um i think it was worth 562 billion dollars so it is quite significant china does not import um i would say this the the main commodities that china does import um, are those manufactured products such as electronics machinery plastics um, furniture and other types of consumer goods um, that of course all of us are very much used to uh, and those imports are used for consumer and industrial purposes. So they are used in manufacturing that takes place here in the United States. Decoupling from that would definitely be impossible, I think, especially in, in our current economy. Um, but none of those items are truly vital. So if the United States did want to replace, um, let's say, um, electronics imports from China with, with something else, I think they would be able to do it. I think price points would change and I think consumers would complain because it, of course, any anything else would be far more expensive uh, to, to import and then to sell to consumers. So the, 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 the end consumer would be highly, highly unhappy with that switch because they would have to pay more. But um, I think certainly there's nothing that, um, um, you know, like crude oil, um, or, or something like that that's truly vital and would absolutely crush the economy. Um, but, you know, $562 billion worth of imports is extremely significant. And um, it, it's something that would uh, impact every single aspect of, of consumers' lives here in the United States. You know, in this sense, the 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 competition between china and the united states today is of a very different quality from what let's say the competition between the soviet union and the united states was because those were two really truly uh separated economies right that, that produced the same goods but internally in different mechanism and what we are seeing now is a is is well it is still a globalized world even though the these partners are trying to reposition themselves but it's a bit like an unscrambling an egg and that's not re that's that's really tough to do. So yelling, going to to China and complaining about over over capacity is is clearly just is, is a political act. The interesting thing is mm -hmm. that that it could take place because the Chinese could have refused to receive her, but didn't. Um, did did that? What are your thoughts on that one? That the Chinese actually are willing to talk to Yellen, and I think she even met Xi Jinping, right? Um, she talked to him. <laughs> I'm not sure if she she might have, um, but I think that after what what was really telling to me at least, once Janet Yellen left, the Chinese Commerce Minister actually said that um, the U.S. sanctions that were uh, put in place already were abusive. Those were his words, and a weaponization of export controls. And you cannot argue with that. He's exactly right. So I think China does definitely view these sanctions and and even um, the uh, harsh message that uh, Janet Yellen delivered last week. They definitely view it in the context of um, sort of trying to manipulate them and and trying to con influence their trade policies. And as a sovereign nation as a country that definitely pursues its own interest as any country should i think that's unacceptable to them and and so i think by by calling yellen out and saying that well the sanctions that you have already implemented are abusive we consider them abusive and uh we consider them to be a weapon of expert control and um you can't really you know you can't really try to promote a uh, free market economy and and only do so when it suits you I think him sort of saying that definitely shows that uh, where, where China stands. I think I think they're not really willing to um, they're willing to hear anybody out, and I think they've they've been very um, they've they've received multiple political leaders over the course of the past 
several uh, several weeks. I know German Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, is still there. I think he arrived yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, but he wasn't quite met the same way. And I think that um, that was really telling too. I think I, I, I think that uh, China is very good with um, welcoming, but I think I think they're still very much set to serve their own interests and and to continue. Um, continue expanding manufacturing and, and sort of becoming um, an irreplaceable producer in the world, which which they certainly have already become that. Yeah, the game is changing and this is it's changing rapidly and we can see it. There's no more in, in imposing imposing your will straightforwardly. Um, this also has to do just one more thing, you know, the Janet Yellen complains and, and the US complains about uh, China unfairly supporting its, uh, you know, supporting its its export industry, you know, and that this mm -hmm. uh, that this violates the terms of fair trade. And what she alludes to without saying is, of course, this, the WTO standards, the World Trade Organization standards. Mm -hmm. um, but that one at the moment is checkmated because the United States refuses to appoint a judge to the appellate body. So the entire the entire mechanism to 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 resolve trade disputes that the WTO is built to do is is currently dysfunctional. And I wonder, I wonder if the Chinese game now is to push the United States to actually reverse that, because at the moment, the, China, the US cannot drag China to the WTO because of its own actions. But if it mm -hmm. if it did appoint a judge, then China could do the same, right, and could drag the United States in front of the of the WTO. I wonder if that's the game. Any, do you have do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's a great question. To be honest with you, I haven't really thought about it. I haven't really given it much thought. But I would think that China does have a long-term strategy. And I think it's it's definitely, it could, could very well be one of their uh, goals in the long term. Um, and, and I think the roles have already switched. I think Yellen, I, I don't know if um, Janet Yellen's visit uh, was considered to be a success uh, by her team, but it certainly wasn't. It was really... I would say um, certainly what wasn't what it maybe would have been five or ten years ago, and and I think that um, to me personally it was almost sad to watch because you can sort of see through her uh, through her words you can you can understand and put them in the context and see that well it's 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 certainly not um, the same scenario that maybe would have been ten years ago so. With respect to the World uh, Trade Organization, that could be uh, China's goal. Um, I think um, I don't I don't see why not. It, it very well maybe. Thank you very much, Lena, for your insights. This concludes the first part of this discussion. There will be a second part on on Lena's channel. Um, please look forward to that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pascal.